Our gospel this morning comes to us from John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And let's join together now in those words from Psalm 19. Lord, may the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, so I got to tell you this morning, I'm getting tired of walking out of the house without my phone. I'm getting tired of walking out of the office without my phone. I'm getting tired of texting my wife, Sally, to bring me my wallet or my keys or my notes. If the world wasn't so blurry, I think I would be walking out of the house without my glasses. I'm having those days sometimes where, well, it just feels like, well, I can best describe it this way, like I've lost my mind. I haven't lost my mind, half of it's just wandered off, and the other half went looking for it. You ever have some of those days like that? Well, at least we can be thankful, hopefully it's not a day like this. I think I'm losing my mind, but no one can tell the difference. You know, these mental stresses have been with us for generations. Just ask anyone who's ever been a parent. I've lost my mind, and I'm pretty sure the kids took it. We laugh, but can that really happen? You know, can you really lose your mind? I don't mean struggling with illness or disease. I mean, literally, can your mind fall off your shoulders, let's hit that next slide, and go someplace completely different? In other words, can the mind become separated from the body? Are our thoughts, emotions, memories, desires, beliefs, our consciousness, can it be separated from our bodies? Or are all those things located in our bodies? I don't mean just our brains, I mean coursing through the whole of our bodies. That is, do the hormones circulating throughout our bodies shape our thoughts and our emotions? Do they make us more competitive or make us more focused? Does an adrenaline surge make us more anxious or make us more energized? Does our stomach have its own internal neurotransmitters that allows us to have intuition or a gut feeling? Does our immune system respond to stress and impact our breathing and our moods? See, psychologists today are telling us more and more that this is exactly true, that all of who we are are related to our minds and our bodies together. On the other hand, our culture is telling us quite the opposite. Our culture is telling us that our minds really are completely separate from our bodies, that our bodies are merely piles of atoms and water and carbon, and they don't have anything to do with the real us, you know, with our minds, with our psyche with our soul. We might say in a more contemporary vein that our bodies have nothing to do with our soul, with what makes us a person, with our personhood, if you will. The culture wants to tell us that our bodies are just kind of like our cars. Cars can serve to protect us. Cars can get us from one place to another. Cars can give us a sense of pride. Cars can sometimes frustrate us. Cars can sometimes give us a thrill, and cars also need a bit of maintenance. But our culture tells us that our bodies, like a car, are just possessions that we own, and they're not really the real us. So I ask you again, 
can the mind, the psyche, the soul really be separated from the body? Because the culture will tell us, of course it can. But Paul, when he writes to the church at Corinth, says, of course it can't. The church at Corinth was confusing the mind and body. In fact, they were acting as if they'd kind of lost their mind. And so Paul writes to them to talk to them about their minds and their bodies. And you know that Paul would know when he was speaking to them that the first human body in the Bible is, of course, a creation of God. The body is important. Adam's body is made and shaped by God. God breathes life into the body of Adam and forms his personhood, the whole Adam. And the creation of woman from the side of man, from the rib of Adam, makes a statement about the body as well, about how there is bodily differentiation, a differentiation that's still rooted in equality because from two bodies comes another body. The differentiation of the bodies and the relationship with each other as one flesh brings forth these new bodies and these new persons that have been formed and knitted together by God. The Bible's insistence that the human body was created by God and not evolved from some lower life form, or it didn't come about because of the wars and romances in the sky of some other group of gods, the Bible places a high value on the body. King David writes in Psalm 8 that men and women have been created a little lower than the heavenly beings, yet are crowned with honor and with glory. And as Scott just read for us this morning, God speaks to us and says, or he's responds to God and says, for you create, it created in my, me my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. God has created the body, and the body is created to be in a relationship with God. Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And Jesus reminds his hearers when he says, don't worry about your life or what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. See, the body is not bad. The body is good. That's proved probably in its greatest form in the incarnation itself. When Jesus takes on a human body, God, John tells us in his gospel that the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus said this when he came into the world, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. See, scripture tells us that the body is really what makes you, you. Paul knew this to be true. But the Corinthian church that we were just reading about didn't really think that was the case. In fact, Paul quotes them, and what they're saying was, everything is permissible for me. I can do anything. You see, they said, Paul, food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach is meant for food, so please get off our backs about the rest of the behaviors you see us engaging in. The Corinthians reasoned that food was both pleasurable and necessary. When their stomach signaled hunger, food was taken to satisfy it, and any kind of food would do. So too, they argued and began to rationalize, well, sex is both pleasurable and necessary, and when our bodies signal sexual desire, they need to be satisfied. In other words, they began to equate the appetite for food with the appetite for sex. They said if there's no spiritual consequence to eating various types of foods, well then, why should there be any spiritual consequence to engaging in various sexual behaviors with those outside of marriage? Guess what? They were trying to separate their minds from their bodies. You ever try to do that? Separate your mind from your body? Because more and more people are trying to do just that. See, our culture today comes and tells us that our biology is not really our personhood. Activists and intellectuals are telling us that biology doesn't define our gender. We can choose our gender because our gender is part of our personhood, not part of our bodies. Our culture will tell us that preborn babies are indeed human bodies, but they're not really persons deserving of legal protection. 
Our culture will tell us that our body belongs to us. It's a possession that we own, and therefore we can do whatever we want to go do with it as long as we're not hurting anybody. I have a right to do anything, and I will be mastered by nothing. Sounds a lot like the church at Corinth, doesn't, doesn't it? Sounds a little bit like California. Maybe Orange County. Occasionally, Aliso Viejo. Well, we might look at the people of Corinth and say, my, oh, my, I would never be involved in sexual immorality, nor would I be so bold as to say everything out there is permissible for me. Well, when you think about it, we actually do the same thing the people in Corinth were doing. We, too, use our minds to justify our behaviors. The Corinthians used food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and they used that to rationalize their sexual activities. We find other ways to rationalize our misbehaviors. Oh, everybody does it. It's not hurting anyone. The world today is different. God wants me to be happy. On the surface, those reasons sound logical and plausible, at least to us, but to our friends and our family, they may begin to see through them as just another way of making excuses like they did in Corinth. To coin a very famous phrase, let's hit that next slide, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. A lot of people think this is a famous quote from Abraham Lincoln. It's not really from Abraham Lincoln. Most people think it originated a couple hundred years earlier in France. Now, as Rob the Preacher, I think it actually originated much earlier than that. I tend to think, well, basically this originated in Ephesus when this guy named Paul was writing a letter to this church at Corinth. And it kind of can be paraphrased a little bit, maybe like this. You can fool all of the people all of the time, and you can fool yourself most of the time, but you can't fool God any of the time. Folks, trying to fool God really is losing our mind. You see, when you get down to it, God knows you. He made you. He formed you. He created you. He knows exactly what you do with your mind and your body. Our gospel reading makes that very clear. As Jesus is calling to his disciples, it's evident that he's calling to those that he knows quite intimately. Philip brings Nathanael to Jesus, telling him that this Jesus is the one that Moses wrote about and the prophets wrote about. But Jesus has already miraculously seen Nathanael under the fig tree. And it's Jesus now who's bringing Nathanael to be able to confess him as the son of God and the king of Israel. Just as he does for you. See, Jesus sees you under the fig tree too. He is, knows you. He knows your intentions before they even enter your mind. Jesus is seeing you and finding you and calling to you no matter what you've rationalized, no matter, no matter what you've thought about, no matter what you've done. See, that's why Jesus took on a body. That's why Jesus lowered himself to become a human being. Jesus assumed a human being so he could make you right again. So he could make sure that your body, the real you, would live forever. Despite our rationalizations and despite our immoral behaviors, Jesus came and assumed a body just like yours, just like mine. So that body could be crucified instead of yours instead of mine. No, folks, everything is not permissible for us, and the wages of our thoughts and our deeds really is death. See, death is what truly separates the mind from the body, and that's not what God designed at all. God sent Jesus to pay the price and to redeem you from death, to redeem the whole you, the whole personhood of you, redeem you so that your body could be raised to life again one day, just like his. Raised to life the whole mind, body of you. Restored to that wonderful sinless state that God created when he first made Adam and Eve. Are you no longer subject to mental illness and diseases? Are you no longer subject to aging? Are you no longer subject to death? It's kind of funny when you think about it. 
that salvation and redemption come to each of us through a body. See, that's what we're celebrating during this five-week period that we're in right now, this five-week period that we call Epiphany. You may remember when Pastor Leland preached last week, he told us that Epiphany is the manifestation of the incarnate God, the manifestation of God become alive in a body. Epiphany means a moment of sudden revelation or discovery or insight. And so if Christmas celebrates the gift that God the Father gave us in his son Jesus Christ, then this five-week season of Epiphany is the unwrapping of that gift. The unwrapping of that gift and discovering anew that our bodies are actually united with Christ. The eternal existence of the body, the future destiny of you as an individual, has been made certain by Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul writes this in Romans, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. That's why Job, in the midst of all the trials and tribulations, could stand there and say, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, in my flesh, in my body, I will see God. Paul tells us that our bodies are united with Christ. They're temples of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul writes in that letter that strange kind of sentence when he says, shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? That is a wrong body, a fake, a false God, a sinful rationalization. He says, of course not, because he who unites himself with the Lord is one in spirit. Pretty good news. So how do we all respond to this good news? of Christ's death and resurrection for us. Paul says it's easy. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, with what you do, because the body's meant for the Lord, because he's gonna raise our bodies, because they're members of Christ himself, because they're the temple of the Holy Spirit, because you've been given the freedom to be blessed and the freedom to glorify God with your mind and your body as well. Even the secular psychologists today tell us the mind-body relationship is central to our actions and our decisions. In fact, have you ever thought that your body is your means of concrete service to God? And that your body is the means of God's divine service to you? Your mind and body are an intersection of service, of prayer and praise and thanksgivings towards God and of salvation, wisdom, and life that comes to you from God. So be at peace this morning. You've been united with the Lord. You've been united with him in his word. The Holy Spirit has come and created faith in your hearts and enables you to confess that faith and live out that faith. You've been united with the Lord in baptism. He paired water with your body and God's name to give you forgiveness of sins. You've been united with the Lord when you gather in Holy Communion and you receive Jesus in bread and body, in blood and in wine, and you are united with God and made part of the body of Christ, the whole church. For the Lord lives in us. He's coursing through our veins and our bodies, driving our breathing, driving our, our actions, our intuition and our decisions, and reminding us every moment that even in those times when we rationalize and fall into some sinful behavior, Jesus is still there with us reconciling us to him because he gave up his body for you. That's the message of the cross. You know, in the Lutheran church, we kind of have this practice, got to thinking about it. Sometimes you see us making the sign of the cross and it's kind of a cool thing when you think about it. It's this physical kinesthetic statement that we make when we sign ourselves with the cross. It's kind of a prayer of the body. And if you think about it, if you do it silently, it's almost even louder than saying something with words. It's a reminder that our bodies are sacred and they've been consecrated to God. And God lives right here and he's with us, uniting us together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as you head out of here today, I don't know when you might next be compelled to make the sign of the cross but I'm gonna encourage you to go ahead and do it. Now, someone may see you do it and they may think for a second that you're kind of losing your mind, but I'm gonna tell you that you're not. Well, 
Probably not. Well, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe actually you might be. Maybe in this season of epiphany, you might be discovering that indeed you are losing your whole mind and your whole body in the gift and grace and the promise of Jesus Christ in his name.